I've entitled my thoughts this morning, The Lifted Veil, and we would invite you to turn to the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 12 through 18, as we continue our journey through Paul's second letter to the church at Corinth. I have to say as we begin this particular message that our focus today is on something that is both prophetic and relevant. And at one point, at some point in the future, I believe that the thoughts that we share with you today will be very relevant to people who are alive in the world at that time. The message today regards the Jewish people, God's dealings with them in the world, and will speak to subjects such as the Lord cutting them out of his blessings as a people, as it were, their arguably future restoration into those blessings, and even, as we come to the end of our thoughts today, even a great trouble that they will experience along with the camp of the saints at the end of time. And so this is what we share with you today, as mysterious as it is interesting, and if the Lord is in the matter, I believe, relevant to your life as well. As a final note of introduction before digging into the text for today, and I want you to hear me very clearly, any time that you are dealing with Bible prophecy, it is always much clearer in hindsight, than it is beforehand. A couple of examples of that. In the book of Daniel, you have one of the most famous prophecies in the Bible, literally a timetable that would be fulfilled in absolute perfection between the decree to rebuild the holy city and the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, culminating in the people of the prince coming and destroying the temple. Daniel says that will be 70 weeks. It was 490 years. It was 70 weeks of years. Could they have predicted that in advance? I mean, week 71 gets here. Hey, wait a minute. The decree was made. When is this going to be fulfilled? It was 70 weeks of years. What's uh, another one? We read in the prophets that before the Lord would come into the world, he would send Elijah before his face, to prepare the way of the Lord. Now, Elijah is an interesting character because unlike anyone else in the Old Testament, with one exception, Enoch, Elijah didn't die. He was carried up to be in glory in a chariot of fire. And so we have prophecy that Elijah would be sent before the coming of the Lord. They expected that prophecy to be fulfilled by a chariot of fire landing in this world Elijah walking out of it and saying, let me now usher in the coming of Jehovah in human flesh. How did that prophecy find its fulfillment? How was it fulfilled? John the Baptist, Baptist, who was not literally Elijah come again. He was not Elijah reincarnated, but he came in the spirit and the power of Elijah. You see, as Elijah leaves his son in the ministry, Elisha, asked for a double portion of Elijah's spirit, and that was given unto him. And of all the amazing things that Elijah did, Elisha did even more amazing things at times. He had a double portion of the spirit and power of Elisha. John the Baptist fulfills that prophecy in that he had the ministry type, the spirit and the power of Elijah, but John the Baptist was not literally Elijah come again. So I say that to say that prophecy in advance is very difficult sometimes. But in hindsight, you look at John the Baptist and you say, oh, that makes perfect sense. Daniel's 70 weeks of years. Oh, perfect sense. In fact, we can plug in all of the various details of human history between the decree to rebuild and the destruction of Jerusalem, and it literally plugs in as if you're going through a simple algebraic equation, 
giving the numbers that are represented by the letters. And we still don't realize why they invented that, right? You had to learn it, but you don't really know why. Don't you shake your head at me, Rachel. All right, get back on track. It literally plugs in the 70 weeks just like you're solving an algebraic equation. And, and we still hate I'm still mad they made me learn that in school. It's very easy to understand in hindsight. Let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 3. We will begin in verse 12 with our reading, but we're going to refer back to some of the things that we talked about last week as we just briefly review, because it will be relevant to what we're going to talk about today. Seeing then that we have such hope, we use great plainness of speech, and I would insist that biblical preaching needs to be great plainness of speech. You say, Brother Ben, you're just a very plain-talking individual, I hope, because I hope you understand what I say when I get into the pulpit. I've heard it said of men that he's a very deep preacher, and it's really hard sometimes to understand what he's saying, but if I'm talking to you in such a way that you don't understand what I'm saying, I'm not actually doing my job, because the preacher is to seek out acceptable words and to present the word in such an easy-to-understand way that you and I can understand and apply what the preacher says to our lives, either by way of clearing up our understanding or teaching us how to live. And so Paul says that we use great plainness of speech. Amen. And not as Moses. Now, how did Moses not use great plainness of speech? And not as Moses, which put a veil over his face. Moses, as we talked about last week, which we will review just a moment, was glowing after spending time on top of the mountain with God as he received the law of God. Because of that, his face was glowing and the children of Israel were terrified. Moses didn't realize he was glowing, but he was glowing, emanating the glory, the residual glory that he absorbed, as it were, in the presence of God. He was radiating and the children of Israel were terrified. He had to put a veil over his face. Now, the veil is going to be used in just a moment as a metaphor for the children of Israel's understanding of the New Testament reality of Jesus Christ and Him crucified. There's a veil. There's an obscurity there. Moses was obscured in the sense that he covered his face because they could not look at him. Let's keep reading that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which is abolished, but their minds were blinded. Their minds were blinded. The word that we're going to look at a couple of times today from a couple of different passages is the word blind, to be blind to something. For until this day remaineth the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ." The veil to the Old Testament is taken away in Christ. In fact, as Jesus died upon the cross of Calvary, when he gave up the ghost and cried out with a loud voice, it is finished, the veil to the temple was what? It was ripped from top to bottom, not bottom to top. Nobody grabbed a razor and went up that arguably that thick veil... You're talking about a veil that's up to three inches thick. It was a very heavy fabric. It is ripped from top to bottom as the earth shook as Jesus gave up the ghost. And to me, that veil, the veil that is taken away in Christ, the temple veil is a very similar concept to this. That veil separated the people from the holiest of holies. What is within the holiest of holies? It was a place only the high priest could go. And it was a place that as he goes in, he has to put on a special robe and he goes in and he takes it off and then he goes about the ministry there and there's all sorts of legends and folklore about you tie a rope to him because if he is impure and he goes into that place and he dies, you're going to have to drag him out by the rope. And I've heard preachers argue that was true and that it wasn't true. But either way, this is the holiest of holies, the place where the Ark of the Covenant was. In the Ark of the Covenant is the broken law, the manna, and Aaron's rod which did bud. 
On top of the Ark of the Covenant is the holiest of holies, outstretched golden cherub arms that form the mercy seat, the throne upon which God would appear as a pillar of smoke or fire. And God's personal presence was in that place at times when they would go to minister in the temple. It was an amazing place, but it was a place that you and I couldn't go. In fact, we couldn't even go into the temple. Because we're Gentiles. But as Jesus died, that veil is ripped, rent from top to bottom. And I believe what that symbolizes more than anything is that the separation between God and man has been severed. The separation. There was separation between you and God because of our sins. Our sins have separated us from God. Another way that you can look at that, the veil in the temple is now rent. God is no longer in the building, as it were. That old covenant was fulfilled. The temple veil is rent. God no longer appears exclusively in that place. But God now, think about what happened on the day of Pentecost. What appeared over the apostles? Cloven tongues of what? Fire. The Holy Spirit is with us in a very personal sense in the New Testament church, God no longer restricts His felt presence to that degree in the four tabernacle walls of the Holiest of Holies or the temple walls of the Holiest of Holies, but God now is with His people in the New Testament church. Another thing to think about as we think about the veil in the temple being rent, you can now go to God as often and intensely as you would like, because the the veil is ripped. He's now accessible. And so we go to him, and we go to him how? We go to him through Christ. Let us come boldly to the throne of grace to find grace to help in time of need, because our great high priest was tempted in all points like as are we, yet without sin. And because of that, we have not a high priest which cannot be touched by the feeling of our infirmities. But he feels what we go through. He knows what we go through. Let us therefore, what? Come boldly to the throne of grace. Understand, the Ark of the Covenant was in a sense a throne. But we can go to the throne of grace all the time, any time, as we so need the help of our Savior, which is touched by the feeling of our infirmities. He knows what we go through when we go through it because he experienced every terrible thing that this world has to offer. And as such, he knows what life is like in this world. He's not separated from us so that he doesn't empathize with us, but he has sympathy. He feels what we go through He is touched by the feeling of our infirmities. And so this veil is done away in Christ. The veil on the heart preventing the sight. And I would also add the veil of the temple that is ripped. This symbolizes so very much. But even under this day when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. There is a veil when Moses is read over the hearts of the Jews even until this very present day. There's a veil. What is that telling us? That there is blindness in part that has happened to Israel. Now, I hope that sentence sounded familiar to you because it comes from a different chapter in a different book written by the same man. There is a blindness in part that has happened to the children of Israel. This veil, when Moses is read, is upon their heart. Now, I said I was going to read this, and I've made comments all the way through it because some of it I just can't resist. I was going to back up and do a little bit of of reading. So we'll read this, and I want to leave that thought of the veil on their heart for you. Nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. Now the Lord is that Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. 
By the way, why you can see the truth is because of the Holy Spirit. Why you understand more about the Word of God every time you open it and study it is because of the Holy Spirit. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is what? Liberty, freedom. The Word of God is open to you through the Holy Spirit. And so unlike the Jews that had a veil over their eyes and their heart obscuring the message, we with an open face behold as in a glass that's a mirror, the glory of the Lord, and are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. You and I have liberty and freedom, and the context here is an understanding. Understanding. We have liberty from the law in Christ, but we have liberty, freedom in our understanding. That is to say, we are free to learn and understand of the gospel message. Now, I'm going to share with you a term in just a moment regarding the Jews They have been, according to Romans 11, judicially blinded. What does judicially blinded mean? Well, what's the word judicial mean? It means that there has been a court sentence and someone has had a verdict. The gavel has struck, they have been sentenced, and they must now live out their sentence. The nation of Israel, because of their rejection of the Messiah, which was a part of the judicial blindness that they experienced for generations of rebellion to God, they are judicially blinded that they cannot see the truth of the reality of the Messiah. Israel is judicially blinded. What are we? We have liberty through Christ, and so through the Holy Spirit, we see clearly that Jesus is the Messiah. We have liberty. It's an interesting application of liberty, but I believe that it communicates part of the message, at least, that Paul is expressing to us. To review what we looked at last week, just in brief, Paul contrasted the letter and the spirit. The letter is a word that Paul uses in this chapter to communicate the law. We've all heard the expression, the letter of the what? The letter of the law. And what that means in any context is we have to do what is precisely written or we will be judged by that which is written. He lays down the letter of the law. Maybe you have a very, very harsh and overbearing parent and they lay down the letter of the law. And usually that means somebody got in trouble. If you have a very strict judge... Their purpose in the criminal justice system is to lay down the letter of the law. We talk about the letter of the law, and it is a matter of rigid adherence to a law, any law, but with regards to the law of God, the letter, according to Paul, earlier in this chapter, does what? It kills. I love that Brother Rick is on the front because he knows the answers to every question that I ask. And I anticipate it and look to him sometimes because he's read the Word of God. He's read the Word of God his whole life at one time, and we're going to have him come up here one day and just give his life story. Uh, At at one point, he was even a Bible smuggler, I believe in the the Middle East, and at times across the Sahara Desert. And um, Anyway, so we have a Bible smuggler in our congregation, and he knows the answers to the questions that I ask. The letter does what? He It kills because we are what? We are sinners. The letter kills because the letter condemns sin. And since we are all sinners, the wages of sin is... He won't say it now, Brother Rick. Say it, death. (laughs) The letter kills because we are all sinners. We are all sinners. I wish that every time that I ask a question that everybody would, would, would answer the question because that would mean that you know what I'm talking about as I say it, and it would also mean that you're paying attention, both of which are very important for preachers, that you know what I'm talking about and that you're paying attention. If we could have both of those things every Sunday, we would be a very happy man. I would be a very happy man. The letter killeth. The Spirit, on the other hand, verse 6, giveth life. The letter has reference to the Old Testament. The Spirit has reference to the New Testament. The Old Testament kills. The New Testament gives life. Now, to give you the 30-second version of what we talked about last week, the law was given to condemn iniquity, to reveal God's righteousness, 
and to point to the Lord Jesus Christ. And so the law is lawful if a man, the law is good if a man uses it lawfully. To lawfully use the law is to point to our depravity, God's righteousness, but through time to the Lord Jesus Christ. And so when you read an animal that is offered, it's got to be without what? Blemish, Blemish and spot. I like it. Y'all are actually all answering the questions now. The law says a lamb must be without spot and without blemish. What's that pointing to? That Christ is perfect without spot and without blemish. But that lamb had to do something, didn't it? It had to die. And when it died, its blood had to be sprinkled by a priest in a sacrifice. What's that pointing to? The death of Christ. Who had to kill that lamb and offer its blood as an offering? The priest pointing to the Lord Jesus Christ. So the law was good. Notice to the Jew who knew everything about the letter of the law, there is a veil over their heart when Moses is read. Well, they could read the letter of it and know that a bull had to be offered or a lamb had to be offered and it had to be offered on a certain day. But they missed the point of it. The point of it was Christ. It's pointing to Christ. You can take the first five books of the Bible and preach Jesus Christ 365 days of the year. You can take those first five books of the Bible and you can preach Christ. When you read Leviticus, everybody's like, oh, Leviticus, it's so boring. Every time you read about an animal dying in Leviticus, it's pointing to Jesus, and then it's not boring. Then it's talking about Christ. You read about the men offering it, it's talking about Christ. You read about what they wore. It's talking about Christ. You read about the purity of not doing this. It's talking about Christ. You read all the things they're commanded to do. It's talking about Christ because he kept the law to a jot and a tittle. Every commandment of the law Jesus kept from the moment he was born. He kept the law. What's it talking about? It's talking about Christ. Suddenly it's not boring. Suddenly it's not legalistic. Suddenly it's not dry. It might be terrifying as you realize that that's written to show your own sinfulness, but it's also comforting because you know the same God who is so holy that He demands our death for our sins sent His only begotten Son as the Lamb that would die. Amen. You read the Old Testament. I hope you see Jesus on every page. I hope you see Christ. The letter kills. The Spirit gives life. But the Old Covenant as we read last week, was glorious. So glorious that Moses, after spending time directly with God, had to cover his face. The Old Testament was glorious. Understand, as New Testament Christians, we do not criticize the Old Covenant. It was good. In fact, in Hebrews, finding fault with them, he took away the first that he might establish the second. There's nothing wrong with the Old Testament. The Old Testament is good. It's God's Word. It was God's will. It was how God wanted to be worshipped, sought to be worshipped in the Old Covenant, just as much as today the Father seeketh such to worship Him. How? Spirit and truth. He knew that one. Y'all didn't know that one. Still say that one. Spirit and in truth. I'm just going to have Brother Rick come finish his sermon because he, he knows every concept. I'll give you my outline and, and you could probably do a better job than me with it. Spirit and and in truth is how we worship him today. In the Old Covenant, he was worshipped according to the letter of the law. The letter kills, the Spirit gives life. The Old Testament, the letter was glorious, but the New Testament is more glorious. So what of that people of the Old Covenant? Okay, This is the major point for today, and we're going to spend the rest of the time we have today exploring this as much as I know how by way of Bible prophecies, more plain Bible prophecies like we're about to read. Is God completely done with them as a people who will worship Him? That's the question. Now, in church history, if you read the writings of, of some even well-regarded preacher figures through church history, men such as Martin Luther, there has been much great animosity against the nation of Israel in writings and sermons and rhetoric and preaching. And so there have been times at church history, in church history, that people believe that God was completely forever done with them as a people, just done with them, period. 
But as we'll see today, there's a couple of references that are clear in Paul's writings that would have us to believe that perhaps before the end of the world, Israel, or at least God's elect among Israel, have the veil taken away, their eyes open to the gospel, and Israel experience a sudden conversion experience in mass. Imagine, if you will, if suddenly the nation of Israel in the Middle East became a Christianized country. Do you know only about half of the people in Israel today are religious Jews? And it's barely that. It might be 48% the last time I looked. It's not a religious nation, the nation called Israel. Now, why is that? Remember Jesus said, I and my Father are one. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. If you receive me, you receive him. If you receive him, you receive me. They're equated, and I could bury you in passages that express that. And that's how they knew his deity and his divinity. Can't have any sermon without mentioning that here. That's how they knew he's divine. Because he and his Father are one, if you've seen one, you've seen the other, Jesus is divine. When they rejected Christ as a people, a nation, they think, we'll reject him, we keep the Father. They didn't believe in him, they believed only in God and glory. And when they rejected the Son, they lost the ability to worship God, the Father, which they had worshipped through the Old Testament, because to reject one is to what? To reject the other. And so this idea that, well, they have God the Father, but we have God the Father and the Son. No, this is why their worship has literally been non-existent since A.D. 70. God wiped the earth of the building in which they worshipped. You say, why not build a tabernacle? Because it's not really about the law They don't really worship according to the law. Very few of them do. Some of them want to rebuild the temple, but I'm over here looking at the word tabernacle or tent. Like, if you really believe that, you could put up a tent right now in Tel Aviv. But the worship of God was taken from them. Okay? That's biblical. That happened. He took the worship from them, as we'll see from Romans 11 in a minute. Is that permanent? Some passages that we want to consider today, I believe, answer that question and point to a day when the gospel will finally be received by that nation, and I would insist that it happens in conjunction with great trouble at the end of time, and when that happens, this world is as good as gone. Done. That's it. So let's look at that in a little greater of a depth. After contrasting the law and the spirit, the old covenant, the new covenant, they worshiped according to the letter. All it does is kill. We worship in accordance with the spirit who's written the laws of God on our heart. It is liberty. It is truth. It is peace. It is illumination. They have, until this day, a veil untaken away There's a veil over their heart and their eyes when the law is read. You and I hear a lamb is offered, we think of Jesus. They hear the lamb is offered, they think of a lamb. Because there's a veil there. God's intent of the law is to point to Christ. It is a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. When they hear the law, they think law. When we hear the law, we think Christ. By the way, let me interject this point. In one encyclopedic resources, uh, resource years ago, I read a great description of what the Pharisees actually did. I believe this came from the Holman Bible Dictionary, which is more like a, a great encyclopedia. The Pharisees took the religion of the Old Covenant from a religion of sacrifice to a religion of law. And we, we still look at it as a religion of law because we've let them define it for us. But the Old Covenant was a religion of sacrifice more than a religion of law. It was a religion of sacrifice because that is what Jesus was going to come into the world and do. On the days, there are sacrifices. Laws govern that, but it was a religion of sacrifice, a bloody religion pointing to Christ. It got turned into a religion of law, do this so that you are. 
do this so that you are. Now, the law was written, God says, and because God says, you are. And the God says you are is God says not to do this since you all did, you're a sinner. So we look to the sacrifice. We look to the coming of the Messiah. The Pharisees took the Old Testament from being a religion of sacrifice to being a religion of law. And it was veiled. Nevertheless, this is verse 16. When it shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. When it shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. Notice the words shall be. Shall be taken away. I want to turn over to the book of Romans chapter 11. Israel has a veil over their heart so that they cannot see or understand the truth of the Word of God as we understand it in the New Covenant age, the 2020 hindsight of history, the Holy Spirit granting liberty. We understand the point of the law was Christ, the Messiah, the Anointed. When it shall... Turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. I believe is an expression of a biblical concept, sometimes in popular church history, of a restoration of Israel to God's blessings. Now, I'm going to give you a huge caveat in just a moment. Like a, this is the size of Alabama caveat in just a moment. Huge caveat. Romans chapter 11. Romans 11 offers thoughts about the cutting out of the Jewish people and grafting in of the Gentiles. Now, there's a sense in which they're cut out. There's a sense in which we're grafted in. There's a sense that this grafting has happened, but there's a sense in which it would be erroneous to apply it. Now, I've told you over and over, one of the most important statements a preacher can say is, in the following sense, the sense of the text, that's biblical. That's what Ezra the priest does as he stands up and gives the word of God. He read the word, the law, and he gave the what? The sense of the text. So in a sense, in a sense is a very important phrase biblically. In Romans chapter 11, we read about God cutting out the Jewish people and grafting in a wild branch the Gentiles. This cutting out and grafting in has reference to God's blessings through the gospel and the kingdom, not the cutting out of people from the family of God and grafting people into the family of God. Those who are written in the Lamb's book of life were written when? Before the foundation of the world. According as he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us under the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. That's Ephesians 1. So this is not talking about cutting people out of the family of God. How terrifying would it be for you and me to think that we could be cut out of the family of God? Because I would do it. I would have it done. It would happen to me because I do so many things that are wrong. What a terrifying thought that would be. This isn't referring to people being cut out of the family of God and grafted into the family of God. This is referring to the covenant blessing of worship and God's blessings on them or us as a people. They, because they rejected the Messiah, were cut out. We... As a wild branch, we're grafted in. And we're talking not about individuals here, but peoples. This is God's, as Joe Holder defined it, corporate blessings on a people. We know a lot about God's corporate blessings as a people. At no point in the American history has everyone in America been a child of God. At no point. No point. God has a people out of na every nation, kindred, and tongue... But not everyone in every nation, kindred, and tongue belongs to God. Out of, important words. But God has blessed America because of the faithful in America and their steadfastness to worship Him. America has experienced God's corporate blessings on them as a people. Israel was cut out of God's corporate blessings 
and we Gentiles were grafted in to God's corporate blessings. And that is what Romans chapter 11 is discussing. There are statements in Romans chapter 11 that it doesn't matter your theological perspective. They are somewhat difficult to understand. One thing is very clear. Without sovereign grace being true, Romans 11 makes no sense. Because there are parts of Romans 11 that talks about how God counted us in unbelief and the Jews in unbelief to have mercy upon all. Counts them all in unbelief to have mercy upon all. What, what in the world does that mean? Well, if you take the common gospel preached in America today, it's nonsensical. But if you understand that God has people out of every nation, kindred, and tongue, there was a period that he winked at our ignorance, but if a person belonged to God in the Old Testament and they were a Gentile and they were ignorant, they still belonged to God. There's no severing that then suddenly you understand what he's talking about when he says that all of his children are counted in unbelief that he might have mercy upon all. And he gets to the end of this chapter and he says, O depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. Who hath known the mind of the Lord? Who has been his counselor? Paul is saying that what I've just said to you blows my mind. That God had people among the Gentiles before they ever knew the word, and they will be with him in glory. And God has people among the nation of Israel, though that nation is cut out of his blessings, they will also be with him in glory if they belong to him, because the gifts and callings of God are what? Without repentance, verse 29, meaning he does not take them away. Now again, I said, the, file this under passages that you don't hear preached a lot in America today. Because, wait a minute, that makes us uncomfortable. If you're the average American, that goes contrary to a lot of the theology that's taught today, which depends on you. Guess what? Salvation doesn't depend on you. What does salvation depend on? Jesus. If Jesus died for me and I fall into gr grievous sin, he still died for me, I'll be with him in glory if I am one of the people whose sins he took away. That's what it is finished means. It means it's finished. Now, I don't want to destroy my life in sin, and I don't want to dishonor and displease him. But I got news for you. The finished work of Christ is the finished work of Christ. He talks about the Jews and their cutting out and the fact that we are grafted in. By the way, another caveat, not all Israel are of Israel. Just because somebody was a physical Jew doesn't mean they were a child of God. It's an important distinction. What does he say in John 8 to some Jews? You are of your father the devil. devil. You're of their father the devil? That means they don't belong to God. Oh, we got Abraham as our father. Really? If Abraham were your father, you'd love me. Why? Because Abraham's the father of the faithful. There's a much greater point of Abraham's life than just being their patriarch. Remember the promise when God called Abraham out of Ur of the Chaldees? That what would have a blessing? through his seed, that all families of the earth would have a blessing through the seed of Abraham. This has been God's intent to have people worship him among the Gentiles all through human history. Eventually it was going to come to that, and it did. I, when we went through the minor prophets, do you remember how many prophecies we covered in the minor prophets that pointed to the coming in of the Gentiles? His house shall be called a house of prayer to what? Jews only? To all people. This was always God's will for people out of every nation, kindred, and tongue to worship him. The purpose of Israel was to show that God chooses, makes choice of a people, not because of who they were. He says that. I didn't choose you because you're the greatest. You're the weakest. But I chose you because I set my love upon you, as he said in the Old Testament. We're talking here, as you see very clearly in verse 5, about elect Jews. Not all Israel that are of Israel. Romans 9 says that. But at this present time, there's a remnant according to the election of grace. And if it be by grace, it is no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. Verse 7, Israel hath not obtained that which it seeketh for, but the election hath obtained it, and the rest were blinded. Election obtains something. God's choice obtains something. 
But despite that, as a people, they are cut out of the blessings of God as a people, as it relates to worship. And I've just got to tell you that there's never been a more afflicted people over the past 2,000 years than the people of the Jews. It's been one affliction after another. Look at the world today. Back up to World War II. It's been that way since they rejected the Christ. Verse 24. Actually, the last phrase of verse 23. God is able to graft them in again. Is God done with them? God is able to graft them in again. If thou wert cut out of the olive tree, which is wild by nature and grafted contrary to nature into a good olive tree, us wild Gentiles, what's a Gentile? A Gentile is a non-Jew. How much more shall these, which be the natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree? Good question. For I would not, now it's plain, I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you be wise in your own conceits. That blindness in part has happened to Israel, is happened to Israel, until the fullness of the Gentiles come in. Israel has experienced partial blindness until, until what? The fullness of the Gentiles come in. Partial blindness. And I would remind you, verse 8, this is judicial blindness. God gave them the spirit of slumber, eyes that they could not see, uh, ears that they should not hear unto this day. He has blinded them as a judgment. But God is able to graft them in again. To graft them in again. So, what is the fullness of the Gentiles? What is a Gentile? A Gentile is a non-Jew. When did the gospel go primarily to Gentiles? Acts chapter 13. Paul preaches publicly. As he preaches to Jews, Gentiles hear and rejoice. The Gentiles say, we want you to come back next week and say the same exact thing again. That's never happened to me. Come back next week, preach this sermon again. Come back next week, we want to hear it again. He goes and he preaches again. As he preaches, the Jews are jealous. Remember Romans 11, they're given the spirit of envy. Eyes that they can't see to provoke them to jealousy as the Gentiles come in as a judgment. That was intended as a judgment for them to see other people enjoy what they prided themselves in, God's blessings on them as a people. Who gets, that in, who gets to enjoy that? You. You are the people, the Gentiles, that God has blessed into his, grafted into his blessings. Paul and Barnabas wax bold. It was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you, but seeing you put it away from you, put it from you, and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. From that point, you know what Paul does? He plants one Gentile church after another with the exact same blessings that the Jewish churches had. When there were schisms between Jew and Gentile as if the Jewish Christians had a more prominent place, in practice or theology than the Gentiles, Paul would rebuke it, even at times rebuking Peter to the face, as he says in Galatians. For so hath the Lord commanded us, saying, I have set thee to be a light of the Gentiles, that thou shouldest be for salvation unto the ends of the earth. Knowledge of salvation, confirmation of salvation, assurance of salvation. Only Jesus brings salvation but you and I learn of it, we enjoy the benefits of it through the preaching of the cross. I can't give you eternal salvation, nor was I offered for salvation through the ends of the earth. That's only Jesus. However, we have the knowledge of it, the confirmation of it, the benefits of it through the preaching of the cross. And when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord. Look at this next statement. 
And as many as were ordained to eternal life believed. Why did they believe? Because they were ordained to eternal life. Now to you, that's like, oh yeah, we know that. We like that verse here. No, listen to me. These were Gentiles. To a bunch of Jewish guys in the first century, G Gentiles ordained to eternal life? What sort of offensive rhetoric is this? Don't they know their second class ordained to eternal life? What gave them the ability to believe it? This ordination. The ordination to eternal life is what enabled the belief. They receive it, they believe it, because they were ordained to eternal life, and as many as were ordained to eternal life believed. We can't take God's sovereignty out of the reception of the gospel. When you preach to somebody and they receive it, it's because God beat you to them. He's faster than you. He moves more quickly than you. He can do a whole lot more with the heart than you can. I can preach to a dead sinner and I can cut them to the heart, but he can change that heart of stone with a heart of flesh, and then the gospel will prick them in the heart. They've got to be ordained to eternal life. All right. They turn to the Gentiles. But in Romans 11 and 2 Corinthians 3, we read about God taking away the veil we read about God grafting them back in, and that's a mystery. Blindness in part, partial blindness has happened until God grafts them back in. When he takes the veil away, the strong case can be made that there is coming a day in which the veil is taken and they receive the word of God, the fullness of the preached word of the gospel. And so again, what if, what if, Israel became a Christian nation in the world. What if? Now, let me give you a couple of caveats. This is the one the size of the state of Alabama. If they are restored, it will not be in an Old Testament context. If Israel is restored, it will be in a new covenant context. That's why I said a Christianized nation. If Israel blows up the dome of the rock, rebuilds the temple, and begins offering bulls, that is not what Paul is talking about. That would be the old covenant they held on to. God finally wipes it from the face of the earth in AD 70. If they are restored, listen to me, it is in a New Testament context. They will be doing exactly what you are doing on the same day of the week. You are doing it. They will be worshiping according to the new covenant. The new covenant. He makes a covenant with the house of Israel after those days, saying, I will put my laws in their minds and their heart. They shall not teach one another, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me from the least to the greatest. That is the context, the capacity in which they will be worshiping if they are grafted back in. They will not be offering. And it boggles my mind when I read even good commentaries sometimes, and men that have it right on so many subjects say, This will be a restoration of temple worship, and Jesus himself will sit in the temple and receive the offerings of bulls and goats and lambs. And I'm just thinking, Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. If someone, if the temple is rebuilt, listen carefully. This is going to be relevant one day. If someone sits in a rebuilt temple and he says, I'm Jesus, come worship me. Please understand that Paul says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 that before the second coming of Jesus, there will be a man called the man of sin sitting in the temple showing himself that he's God receiving worship. If somebody says, I'm Jesus, now come to the temple and worship me, I want you to stay right here in Huntsville, Alabama. Don't get on that plane. Don't go to that temple. Because according to Paul, there's going to be a guy saying that who's not Jesus, but he's referred to as that wicked. That was a term for Antiochus in the Old Testament, but in the Maccabean period, Antiochus, the madman, He's called the son of perdition, the title of Judas Iscariot, the betrayer. And he's called the man of sin, a man of wickedness. This would be grafting them back in to what they rejected initially. They will be worshiping Christ in spirit and in truth. Now, to briefly, 
as it is now 12 o'clock, plug in three other passages, three other concepts. You're like, oh boy, three verses, that might take a couple of hours. We're hungry. It'll be just a moment. Matthew 24, 14, the gospel will be preached through all of the world for a witness unto all nations, then shall the end come. Matthew 24, 14. The gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world. So we live on a sphere. We live on a globe. I'm sorry to break that to you. If you, It is a globe. When you start out going in one direction around the globe, eventually where do you end up? Back where you started. The gospel will go all the way around the world, and I believe it will end up back where it started. And then what happens? Well, what did you just read? Then shall the end come. Then shall the end come. The gospel goes all the way around the world, and then what you have is the end of time. Here's a very famous verse in Matthew 23. You shall no more henceforth see my face until you say, Blessed be he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. That's a quotation of Psalm 118. On one hand, that's a warning. Because you've rejected me, I'm not going to bless you until you say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. But what will they do when Jesus returns? They shall... Look upon him whom they have pierced. You shall know, you shall not see me henceforth. While on one hand this is saying you're not going to experience my blessings until you say blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord, I've just about come to believe it's also prophetic. Before they see him again, when will every eye see him? At the second coming of Christ. They will say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. The elect among Israel will believe, if that's applied in that way. Now, this is loose grip theology. The veil shall be taken away, Paul says, blindness in part, until the fullness of the Gentiles, when it goes all around the world, the fullness of the Gentiles, when it's preached throughout all nations. Now, let's end with a little bit of creepy and perhaps Bible prophecy that might make you stay awake at night. When the thousand years are expired, and I believe that has reference to the church age in which Satan is bound, where he does not deceive the nations anymore. Satan has not deceived the nations like he did throughout human history in the church age. He deceived the nations so much they did things I can't repeat to you in this pulpit. But over the last two millennia, They've been Christianized. They've been the ones with the rational mind that they've never had before through human history. They were offering one another on altars to false gods for crying out loud. Temple priestesses, I'm not going to tell you what that involved. And those were the things that you could talk about in the pulpit. There's coming a day in which Satan is loosed and he begins to deceive the Gentiles again. To the degree that he did. He goes about to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle. Gog was an Old Testament reference king in Ezekiel 38. Magog was a region of land mentioned after the colonization of the world after Noah's flood. Magog is a region of land, Gog is a king. To gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. There are so many people fighting at the second coming of Christ after Satan is loosed that their numbers rival the sands of the sea. Talk about World War III. This is beyond anything we have ever seen. If in every quarter of the world, north, south, east, and west, across the breadth of the earth, so many people are fighting that they rival the sand of the seashore for number. And again, this hasn't come to pass. Because what ends it, we shared this with you recently, what ends it is not American might, 
Western ingenuity, technology, or any other thing. What ends it is the second coming of Jesus. He returns in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God. He consumes the man of sin with the brightness of his coming, according to 2 Thessalonians 2. But Gog and Magog compass the camp of the saints. And I believe that has reference to Christianized peoples around this world. You are the camp of the saints. You're camped out, as it were. You don't belong here. You're pilgrims and strangers. What do pilgrims and strangers live in? They live in a camp. But notice that Gog and Magog also go up against the what? The beloved city. Now that boggled my mind my entire life. Why would he go up against the beloved city if God himself has cut them out? Well, if they, before the end of time, are now a Christianized people, and Jerusalem is now the latest, greatest bastion of the gospel of Christ as far as the city is concerned, that's why Gog and Magog are attacking them. The gospel reaches its place of origin. Satan is loosed and he goes out to destroy everyone who names the name of Christ. And as it seems dire, as fighting sweeps around the globe, as the camp of the saints and the beloved city are encompassed, fire came down from heaven and devoured them. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire. There's a great white throne the dead were judged according to their works. You are not the dead. And God's children, those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life, are carried home to be with Him in glory. How might this thought be relevant to you today? I don't know. It equips you to look for things that will quite possibly happen before the end of time. And when these things begin to happen, Jesus would have you to discern the signs of the times and the seasons. When these things begin to happen in the world, Jesus would tell you to look up, for your redemption draws nigh. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for giving us world history in advance. If you do intend to open the eyes and take away the veil to remove the judicial partial blindness that has smitten your people among the nation of Israel for the past two millennia. Praise be your name for that. Thank you, Lord, that you counted Jew and Gentile that belong to you alike in unbelief, that you might have mercy upon all who has known, your, who has known the mind of the Lord, who has been your counselor, Father. Your ways are marvelous. They are above and beyond our ways. Thank you, Lord, that not even our failures and rejections of your word can take us from your son. And Lord, we pray in that final day, when this world is on fire and there is warring and fighting everywhere, as that wicked one goes about in one last attempt to harm your people. Thank you, Lord, that we, in that moment, as we wait, get to look up, look up and wait for the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, as we're now 2,000 years after his ascension into glory and the gospel has reached literally the far reaches of the world, if it is to go back home where it began and then your son returns, we simply say, even so, Lord, come quickly. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Forgive us of our sins. Help us to understand more about your great glorious word. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.